Here on the Shree Isabel Show, it's not just about the music, but ministry, awareness, whether it's social, dealing with our health, emotional, and whatever the case may be. It's very important to me that we are well-rounded and the entire man, body, soul, and spirit is ministered to. With that being said, I am so excited for our next guest. He is the founder and senior pastor of Kingdom Fellowship Christian Life Center in Louisville, Kentucky, CEO of the Life Development Corporation. 2020, he founded the Justice and Freedom Coalition, which has been actively pursuing equality and equity for all. And just recently, he announced that he would be a 2022 mayoral candidate for the city of Louisville, Kentucky. And most of all, he is a brother in Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the Shree Isabel Show, Pastor Tim Finley. Yay! <laughs> hey, thank you so much for having me. I am honored, honored to be a part of this. So thank you so much. And congratulations. This is, again, just an amazing opportunity that you have to spread the gospel and, oh, and educate thank you. our people. Thank you. You are so kind. Thank you. Now, Pastor, um, tell us, to, to the listeners that may not be familiar with um, the Louisville area, uh, Tell us about Pastor Tim Finley. Well, um, as you already mentioned, I am the proud pastor of Kingdom Fellowship Christian Life Center. Um, I founded that church in 2008 with my mother and my sister, a handful of folks. And uh, the Lord has been tremendously kind to us. Um, I was raised in a house um, that has always taught not just um biblical principles, um, but also was very, very adamant um, that we understood, my brothers and sisters, uh, that we should be active in our community, that we should be um, stand for righteousness and justice, um, equality, equity, and love. And because of that, um, social justice has always been a staple of, of the ministry that God has given me. Um, and because that's been the staple, Pretty much everything that I've done over the last 13 years um, as a pastor has been geared towards discipleship, um, but also um, seeing that all people um, are treated um, in a way that is fitting of their human identity, that they're human, that they deserve love, that they deserve civil liberties and things of that nature. Um, and especially when we talk about black and brown communities, um, there are so many sort of uh, issues that we have seen in this country, 401 plus years, um, that I believe that the church, um, and specifically the black church and black preachers, um, it has to be a part of who we are and what we do um, to do as Jesus has said, um, and set captives free, give sight to the blind ears uh, to those who are deaf. And I think that that's the mantle of prophetic preaching, uh, just the prophetic mantle that is on my life. And I'm certainly thankful for all of the opportunities that God continues to give me. That's absolutely awesome. Could you go in a little bit more depth about um, your, you, you mentioned it, but go into just a little bit more depth about your particular assignment. And you meant, you mentioned it again earlier about the social justice. What, what fueled that call? I know you, I, of course I follow you. I mean, I probably like everything that you put up, you know, when you post online because <laughs> it just it speaks so deeply um, to the heart and to the issues of what's going on today. So what what really fueled that passion? I know you mentioned about how, you know, you were brought up that way and it was instilled. But was there something that really sparked that assignment on you? Yeah, I think there's been several um, instances where just personally. You know, whether that was growing up in public school and having to deal with teachers that treated me and other uh, students, other black and brown students differently. And, and you see that early on to what many black men and women have experienced when it comes to law enforcement. There have been times where I literally feared for my life and I was pulled over, handcuffed and sat on the curb when um, they said it was because I, I didn't use my signal. Uh, but then talk to and, and handle this in a certain way. Those are the kind of things that sort of shape you and, and, and kind of give you this fire and passion to say, 
I, I not only want better for myself, I not only want to right this wrong in my life, but I don't want anyone else to have to deal with this. And I think those kinds of instances, but I'll tell you, I think where the the passion and the fire was really flame, the flame was really fanned, I should say, um, was in seminary. Um, I went to early on in, in my ministry before I was a pastor, when I was sort of uh, just an associate minister and underneath of uh, that pastor at the time that I was really, really learning from, they sent me to uh, Southern Baptist Seminary here in the uh, Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, President Al Mohler, uh, which is a, uh, and hopefully I don't get in trouble for this, but a notorious <laughs> evangelical seminary, which is very well known. Well, I went there and uh, in the, the church that I was a part of, Black Church sent me there. And I remember sitting in some of those classes, and this is a place of higher learning, critical thinking. Um, it is vastly, vast majority is, is white. And hearing the way that they interpreted scripture, the way that they exegeted scripture, and the way that they taught us to interpret and exegete scripture, it never sat well with me. It was something that um, the way that they glossed over things, the way that they had this flagrant um, sort of perception of Jesus and the fact that justice was missing from, you know, the, the ethic that was taught there. Uh, I'll say that that really, really, it sent me down the path. And, and I tell people all the time, the path for me was sort of rediscovering who I was and discovering what Christianity is and that many of the things that I had been taught early on, you know, whether it was in previous churches or certainly in this particular seminary, um, there was so much attention put on things that were minor, mm -hmm. but then other areas where you talk about, you know, the Bible is not ambiguous when it talks about how you know that you're saved. You know, there are things that people argue about all day and all night, right. and then there may be some credence to it. You may want to argue that. But the one thing where there is no argument, there's no ambiguity whatsoever, is you know that you're saved by how you treat other exactly. people. If you have love. And as simple as that is, and as much most, most people will agree with that and amen that, but the truth is, that's I wasn't seeing that. And many of the people that were treating other people um, in particular ways, um, and this is even before Donald Trump, or even before I was really conscious of, you know, certain political leanings, um, before I even knew about that, it just seemed as though there were certain groups of people treating other groups of people in a way that was not loving. And the more I delved into that, the more I began to understand what social justice was. And then I started reading James Cone and Black Liberation Theology. And I started reading books like um, um, uh, Christ and the Lynching Tree, mm. God of the Lynching Tree. Um, I started reading books like uh, Jesus and the Disinherited. And these different books, they brought a different perspective that much of what was being taught did not line up with Scripture. Right. And the way that people were treating other people did not line up with Scripture. Well, that stuck with me. And I was shaped in that. I'm thankful for my mother and father who cultivated that even in those years and having discussions with them and conversations so that when I started pastoring, I was absolutely um, just bent on building a church God's way, being the under shepherd, but making sure that the truth um, of the word of God was taught. And the truth for me wasn't just shouting, dancing, speaking in tongues, right. running, you know, being baptized in Jesus' name. All that's wonderful. But the truth of the scripture for me, in addition to that, was you can't be Christian and not care about what's going on with other groups of people. Yes. And then I started getting into things thinking about health care. People say, well, no, Pastor, you bring politics into this. Well, I, I'd ask people, if Jesus was walking this earth, are you telling me that Jesus wouldn't want everyone to have health care? Right. You know, and then it started it started becoming very apparent to me that we were trying to group certain things under 
the banner of politics when really it's, we've politicized it. The truth of the matter is, I believe that when the scriptures talk about on that last day, when many will come and say, Lord, did not do this and did not do that and did not do this. And he's going to say, depart from me, you work of iniquity. I never knew you. And that always puzzled me because I'm thinking, well, they did all this stuff. They said all these things, but, but from Jesus's response, something was missing. That's what drove and that's what drives my social justice, justice ethic. And even in 2020, of course, people know Louisville here recently with Breonna Taylor. And I'm always, you know, people say, oh, Pastor, it was good. It's good to see you so active in, in the protest. And it's good. To, some people say that. Other people they say something right. different. But they say that. And I've always felt a way because I said, you know, I shouldn't be the outlier. The truth is a young woman was murdered. And it's clear that there were wicked, nefarious things that were going on. Yes. There's no way that we as Christians, as preachers, as pastors, should not be calling for justice. And it's no way that we shouldn't be speaking truth to power. Um, there's no way that we shouldn't understand that true prophetic preaching in the New Testament order is speaking the heart of God. It's not, it's not foretelling cars houses and, yes. and money yes sir but prophetic preaching is speaking that god is not pleased with this that's right you know jeremiah Wright. we didn't like you know folks didn't like some of the things he said when barack obama was running and he used some language that people were just so up in arms with but i tell people all the time if you go back and listen to that brilliant message that was prophetic preaching at its finest and he was saying, there's a problem in America. Right, exactly. God is not pleased. Yes, sir. And judgment is coming. That's prophetic preaching. Yes, sir. Prophetic preaching ain't telling you your zip code and your social Come on. You know what that is. Come on. So I just, that sh shifted. And, and to be honest, that really, really, it's, it's taken me down a particular road that it's liberating, it's free. But it's also heartbreaking because you look around and you see that many people, and I'm not, I love the church. I love the church. And I, I'm very careful about how I treat the church. And I'm never wanting to be overly critical to the point to where, you know, it, it becomes sacrilegious. But I will say this I think that a lot of times the, the heartbreaking part of the church for some churches is that not only are people not involved, and not understand the justice of scripture and the need for social justice. The heartbreaking part is they don't want to be right. They think God is pleased with them getting back to the church house, hearing their favorite choir song, doing church the way that they're comfortable doing church. And that's it. And that the rest of that stuff is for other people. And I think that many people, if they're not careful, they are going to find out that when God talked about love and he talked about the things that we, we sort of gloss over in scripture, they're going to find out that he was serious about that. Right. We, we love the story of the good Samaritan, but for some reason we miss the social justice, the implications of social justice in that, in that sort of uh, kids church parable that it's huge things like that it's all through scripture that he's saying listen y'all you can't be so concerned getting to where you want to get to that you you walk in past people that are dying on your block right exactly and you say nothing there's a problem there yes sir that that is a perfect lead into my next question pastor tim um because mm -hmm. probably like me you um i'm Assume I, well, I don't want to assume, but I grew up st very strict apostolic Pentecostal. Again, yes, I love P A W Kentucky and Tennessee. Council. Come on, come on, come on through here, <laughs> so you understand. Now, now, my I my remember. next question, um, and and probably specifically to the Black Church, and I always say I go one sub deeper the Pentecostal Black Church. What would mm -hmm. you say, or what would your response be to those that may say? Um, the church shouldn't be so involved in political affairs because your your assignment is different. And I know you understand mm -hmm. that and you realize that. And I I can just imagine probably backlash or 
uh, from, mm-hmm. from what we call mm-hmm. the old school um, mm-hmm. to, to those people that think, you know, oh, that's just not something we should be involved in. And, you know, what what would be your response? Well, I would ask them why they think that. And then respectfully and with as much um, compassion and grace as I could muster, because I believe in being respectful, even if I don't agree, right. I would just talk a certain thing. So even if I'm in complete disagreement with an elder, uh, there's a way you do that. So I would say this, not this way, but I'm going to say it to you, but I would say something akin to this. You have to stop adopting white theology. Well, <laughs> what, what I have found, what I have found out, and this is another awakening for me, the black church is so brilliant and genius and anointed, but yet we have adopted in so many ways white theology that was designed to keep us manipulated and and operating under this identity that's less than. So for instance, and I, and I know that's a, a mouthful, when you go to a Christian bookstore, very rarely do you find black, black scholars, black the, uh, uh, theologians. It's all white, and in many ways, 90% white evangelical. Right. Now, white evangelical showed us their God in 2020. Well, As I was, uh, I, I was featured in a Vice Media documentary, and I made a statement within the first 10 minutes, and you got to check this out because they got really mad at me on this. Hmm. But I was asked in the documentary about the evangelical church, and I said this, I, meant, I mean it, and I, and I believe in backing things up with Scripture. I don't believe they're saved at all Well, because you have to have fruit and there's no fruit. Come on. Um, but the issue is that we have been, we've been um, sort of deceived into believing that Jesus was not a revolutionary, that Jesus did not call out political structures, that Jesus did not go in the opposite direction of things that culture was trying to get him to do. And I need people to understand that I am not saying that the church ought to become some political um, campaign rally center. I'm not saying that at all. But healthcare has been politicized, but it's really not political. Criminal justice has been politicized, but it's really not political. Education has been politicized, but it's really not political. Yes, sir. And so on and so forth. So if we're saying we, we're not going to get political, then that means we're not going to deal with issues that have been politicized, but that we as black and brown people are underneath us. Our kids are dealing with education issues. Oh, COVID-19 has killed two and a half times the rate um, in black and brown communities than white communities. Now the vaccination has rolled, has rolled out. Get this. In February in Kentucky, at the time that I did a vaccination site here, and we vaccinated over a thousand people, and they told us to only go for a hundred, and I refused. But this is what's amazing: at the time that we did it, three hundred and thirty thousand white people had been vaccinated. Wow! Only sixteen thousand white the black people, black and brown, wow. had been vaccinated. Now here's my issue: when someone says, "Pastor Tim, you can't get all in that politics stuff." Politics has our kids at a disadvantage at school. It has our mothers and grandparents and aunts and uncles dying because of health care inequities. It has our young men being incarcerated at an alarming rate in the criminal justice um, sector, and so on and so forth. So basically what you're saying when you talk about not getting political is doing what white people has told black people to do for 401 plus years, and that is accept your plight, be quiet, read this Bible page that I will give you, and I will tell you how to preach it, slave, and say nothing more. Wow. And we've missed that that is not God, that is not the church, and the church has always, we, Jesus said that we are salt and we are light. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. If you're hiding the light, then what good are you? And that, for me, 
is the issue. I would say to that elder, where did you learn that? And why do you think they told you to be quiet about that? That's right. Because they don't think you should ever speak against the things that they are using. And I don't mean this to say of all white people. I have white people in my church. One of my most faithful deacons is a white brother who baptizes his kids all the time. We, I love everyone. Right. But that, you know, he knows this. There may be a Sunday where I have to get up and say some things. And it doesn't mean that I'm coming for you in particular, but it does mean I've got to speak to what's happening in the streets. And I'll say this and, and I'll, I'll, you know, give it back over. <laughs> but here's what's, this is what's important. If a young black man is killed by police, a young black woman is killed by police and her family, friends, co-workers, whatever the case may be, they're a part of the church that I pastor. For me not to get up and say something is insensitive. It is, it's not ministry. I'm not comforting. I'm not dealing. If, if, it's, if it's happening um, under sort of nefarious circumstances, I've got to speak to that. And many of the churches are, are, you know, just not addressing things. It's almost as if you're trying to ignore what is happening right in front of your face and people are dying. And I think that's where I just feel a mantle. I feel a, an assignment, a push yes. that you can't be quiet. So that, that would be my answer. That's a long answer. I know that's okay. That's, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that I, I mean, you, you don't spark something in my heart. I mean, that, that is absolutely <laughs> powerful. Thank you so much. Um, tell our listeners, you got a lot going on. Tell our listeners how they can connect with you. Well, I'm on all social media platforms. Um, Tim Finley Jr., Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, all that good stuff. I would love if you if you would um, support my mayoral bid, my mayoral campaign. Um, you can go to Finley for Mayor. That's F-I-N-D-L-E-Y, the number four, Mayor. Dot com, And there you'll see how you can donate, how you can uh, get on our email list and we'll keep up in touch, keep in touch with you. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm out there. Check out the Vice documentary. It was really cool. If you just Google Tim Finley Jr. and Vice documentary, it should pop up. Um, it's called uh, God Country. And uh, I think you'll enjoy it. It's a behind the scenes look at my life. They followed me around for a couple of days, went to the barbershop with me, went to church with me. And uh, it was cool. It was cool. So, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Awesome. Awesome. I always have my guests end in prayer. Uh, you're a man of God. Uh, if you don't mind, just go ahead and lead us in prayer. Absolutely. Father, we thank you again for this time together. We thank you for uh, platforms such as this to come on and have wonderful dialogue and to share the gospel so that those who are hearing might be impacted, encouraged, and someone would even come asking, what must I do to be saved? And Father, we pray that everything that has been spoken during our time together um, is for your glory, that it edifies you. Father, I pray for those who are listening right now, that that person that may be discouraged, that person that may feel downtrodden. I pray that you would lift them. I pray that you would encourage them. And Father, I pray for our country. I pray for our various states. Even in this time of voter suppression and the tactics of the enemy, in this time of hunger and houselessness in our country, Father, we lift up people. We lift up people. I pray that you would maneuver the church, maneuver those who are filled with your spirit, filled with the Holy Ghost, maneuver us to be a blessing to people not just to walk around callous to what people are dealing with but open our hearts and minds that we understand that on this holy thursday the scripture of holy thursday there uh in the gospel according to john is that it's our love our love that people know that we're disciples and father i pray right now that you would favor us that you would bless us Forgive us of our sins and all of our shortcomings, and we'll be mindful to give your name the glory, the honor, and the praise that it's due. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Tim. I, Thank you for having me. I appreciate me. you. I am praying for you. Louisville family, if you're listening, y'all know what to do. Tim Finley for mayor. So we're just asking all our listeners Absolutely. to please support. Go to that Tim, uh, Tim, I'm sorry, Finley for mayor. 
and just support mm -hmm. my brother in Christ. I believe God is going to use you. I believe God has called you for such a time as this. And just thank you again for being with us today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And, you know, anytime I can do anything to help, you call me. I'm there. Yes, sir.